Those who are able, please remain standing for the reading of our gospel lesson this morning. We're reading from the gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, verses 1 through 28. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands before they eat. He answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever speaks evil of father or mother must surely die. But you say that whoever tells father or mother, whatever support you might have had from me is given to God, then that person need not honor the father. So for the sake of your tradition, you make void the word of God. You hypocrites! Isaiah prophesied rightly about you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. Then he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out And started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Amen. Please be seated. Excuse me. So, I had a sermon planned for today that is not the sermon I'm about to preach. I wrote my original sermon two Mondays ago, and a lot's happened since then. Um, I wrote it two Mondays ago so that Lolly and the boys and I could go on one last trip before Wyatt started kindergarten. And I could come back and not have to write a sermon as we got both boys settled into their new schools. You may remember that a couple of weeks ago I preached on making plans and how we're supposed to check our plans against God's and be open to following God's plan when necessary. Those of you who were here may remember that. Today's sermon is not my plan. It's God's plan. In fact, until Wednesday this last week, I thought my sermon was written and ready. And I debated the relative merits of changing it even into Thursday. Whether or not we should just move on, on to the next thing, on to the start of school, on to the start of all the busy activities coming to the church this fall. But on Wednesday, God put it on me to go back and read today's lectionary text. And when I read, it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. I knew I had work to do. A new sermon to write. 
But that's probably enough about my sermon writing angst. Let's turn our attention to our passage from Matthew this morning. At the beginning of the passage, Jesus is once again embroiled in an argument with some Pharisees from Jerusalem. It's important to note that these are not all Pharisees. It's not all Pharisees and scribes. It's not everybody. It's not all the Jews. It's not uh, everybody. It's a particular group. He is embroiled in an argument with some Pharisees from Jerusalem. And this particular group of Pharisees want Jesus' disciples to wash their hands before they eat. Reasonable request to us with modern ears. We know you're supposed to wash your hands before you eat because it keeps you from getting sick. But that's not what's at stake here. This request, this question, this challenge from the Pharisees isn't about personal hygiene. It's about ritualistic purity. You see, this practice of washing one's hands before every meal was not prescribed in Scripture for Israelites to do in order to be pure, in order to be clean, in order to be able to approach God, in order to maintain righteousness. It wasn't a part of God's Scripture and commandment about what it meant to maintain that righteousness for you to have to wash your hands before every meal. You washed your hands if you touched something unclean, if you engaged in a practice or had something going on in your life that had made you unclean, then you washed your hands, but not on an every meal basis basis in order to maintain that righteousness. Instead, this was a legalistic tradition of the Pharisees to determine who was a real Israelite. Who was Israelite enough? And who wasn't? It was purely a part of their tradition their heritage. And Jesus' response to them highlights this. You see, there is very little evidence that anyone in Jesus' day practiced the tradition of not giving what should go to father or mother to protect them and keep them well in their old age to God just leaving the parents without support. There's very little evidence that anybody, even in the Pharisaic tradition, actually practiced that, did that anymore in Jesus' day. And yet, Jesus still uses it as the example, as the challenge to their pushback about tradition. As a tradition that violates the commandment of God, and presumably Jesus knows that it has been abandoned by most Pharisees precisely because it violates Scripture and because it violates common human decency. Not to give away everything that you were required by the law to keep back to care for your parents. But Jesus still uses it to say, Look, What is a part of your tradition and heritage? Why would we give tradition more weight than Scripture? And yet these Pharisees still want Jesus to impose impossible rules and regulations on his disciples and on the people gathered to hear Jesus in order to preserve their tradition of who is a real Israelite instead of building the kingdom of God. So at this point, Jesus appeals directly to Scripture to bring his point home. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. Isaiah to the exiled people of God. At this point, at this point in the passage, Jesus knows that continued conversation with the Pharisees would be fruitless. So he directs his next statement to the crowds. 
His statement to the crowds is in direct contradiction to what the Pharisees wanted him to do and say. And after Jesus makes his statement, after Jesus turns to the crowd and makes his statement, we hear from the disciples that the Pharisees are offended. He's offended them. The religious leaders, the ones in power, he's offended them. But apparently Jesus doesn't care that they are offended. He says as much. He indicates that they are not of God and that they are blind leaders who will end up in the pit with those who follow them. Blind guides leading the blind. I think this day it's important that we agree that the leaders of white terrorist groups in this country and the elected officials and religious leaders who continue to defend their rhetoric and actions still embody this leadership parable, the blind leading the blind. And it's important for me to say today that sometimes those who preach the gospel simply cannot afford to care if those who hear the message are offended. Peter wants to know, curious, inquisitive, most of the time not getting it, Peter, wants to know what Jesus means by all of this. So he asks, thankfully for the rest of us, he asks, and Jesus explains that whatever goes into the mouth doesn't stick around forever. Whether it was clean or dirty when it went in, when it comes back out, it's dirty. We all know this, common human experience. It doesn't stick around, it doesn't defile us, but instead it is what comes out of the mouth. What comes out of the mouth? that shows whether the person's heart is defiled or not. We say it is what comes out of the mouth, but a more accurate little literal translation is the things that we vomit up are what defile. So for example, if what comes out of a person's mouth is hate speech, bigotry, racism, or equivocation about denouncing these evils that are meant to divide, intimidate, incite fear, and ensure that power remains in the hands of those who have always had it, you know that what is in their heart is defiled. That's our indication. No matter how much they try to wash their hands of it. The passage for today then takes a strange turn to where Jesus is caught using language that he has just denounced. At first, he just ignores the Canaanite woman. He does not answer her cries at all. But his disciples can't take her presence and persistence, and so they press him to send her away. He starts by saying, I have only come to the lost sheep of Israel, to the Israelites, to my people, God's people. But when she begs for mercy for her daughter, when she literally gets on her knees and places her body in front of him and begs for mercy for her daughter, he responds with a common insult of Jews towards Canaanites, calling her and her daughter dogs. She persisted. And she tells Jesus that even dogs get the crumbs that fall on the floor. She adopts his dismissive language. And makes another appeal. It is for her persistence in the face of his dismissiveness and insults that she is praised and that her daughter is healed. 
It is for her persistence in seeking the mercy of God, the kingdom of God from Jesus, the one who in this case dismisses and insults her, that she is praised and that her daughter is immediately healed. I will not this day explain away Jesus' words and actions in this story of the Canaanite woman. They are hard. They don't seem like Jesus. They don't feel right. They don't sound right. They make us uncomfortable. But uncomfortable is exactly where we need to be. I will not this day explain them away. Instead, I will say that for me, a relatively young white man from South Carolina, I am grateful for the witness of Jesus changing his mind around the issues of race, ethnicity, and gender in his day to be more graceful, merciful, and inclusive. I am grateful that, the, that Matthew, the writer of this gospel, chose to keep this passage in the story, chose not to drop it from the tales of Jesus, chose to have it included so that we could see that even Jesus changed his mind, that even Jesus redeemed and lived these prejudiced thoughts and actions. I am grateful for that witness this day. For us, though, we need to acknowledge that we do not change our hearts and minds and start dispensing mercy as though we were Jesus, as though we are Jesus. When we change our hearts and minds, it's not so that we can go out and be the saviors of the world. The world has a savior, and it's not me and you. When we change our hearts and minds, we confess. That's the first step of changing our hearts and minds. Confession. We confess our sin, our complicity. We turn to Scripture to learn the true way to live in peace and love with our neighbors. That same Scripture that we just handed to our third graders, that Scripture for you third graders who out there has the truth of Christ in it. When you read it from cover to cover, when you learn the stories, when you learn the heart of God, you learn that God wants to include more and more people in God's ever-expanding kingdom, God's ever-expanding mercy and grace. That's what's in that scripture. That's what's in that scripture that we handed out today, and it's a part of our way to confess. It's a part of our way to change our heart and mind, to turn back to that scripture, to learn what's actually in there after we have confessed. And we have to start listening to and following the lead of those who have been most hurt and oppressed by the powers and principalities of this world. If we're really going to change our hearts and minds, if we're really going to follow Jesus' example to be more inclusive, to bring more people into the gospel of Jesus Christ, to bring more people into the grace and love and mercy of Jesus Christ, we have to follow the lead of those who are willing to risk themselves in speaking up. That is what it should look like to begin to change our hearts and minds. To repent of and resist the evil, injustice, and oppression of this world. If that sounds familiar, it's because it's from the liturgy that we use when we uh, do baptisms and professions of faith. To repent of and resist the evil, injustice, and oppression of this world is something that almost each and every one of us in this room has promised to do before God and one another. And to me, it means that there is hope. There is hope for me. Hope for us who are white living in this country. That Jesus changed his mind and made a way for us to do so. Because here's the thing, there are those of our complexion you and me sitting in this room today, there are those of our complexion who still want to hold on to the tradition, the heritage of racism and bigotry and hate in this country. There is no doubt about that. Radical white terrorists descended on Charlottesville, Virginia, twisting Christian scripture to justify their terrorism. 
And for us, we need to remember and confess for us, me and you sitting in this place right here, right now, we need to remember and confess that the twisted doctrines they espoused, the warped interpretations of scripture, tradition, and experience they proclaim used to be widely held in virtually all white churches in the South, if not the country. The same things, maybe not with the same violence and vitriol that they spew it today, but those same things used to be espoused in virtually every white church in this country, or at least in the South, including this one. And when white churches finally wised up, when we finally decided that we shouldn't hold these doctrines anymore, that we shouldn't preach them from the pulpits, we shouldn't teach them in Sunday school, when we shouldn't have them as a part of our faith and life together anymore, when we finally wised up, here's what we did. We went silent on the issue. We just went silent, at least at the local level. We officially stopped holding the racist beliefs, but we never confessed and repented of them. And so they linger in the hearts and minds of our collective culture and in the hearts and minds of far too many individuals. They linger until they are spewed, vomited into the world by white terrorists. But it isn't just white terrorists who spew it. It's spewed when we tell and laugh at racist jokes. It's spewed when we make a knee-jerk racist remark. It's spewed when we stay silent when someone else does these things. It's spewed when we argue that removing historical monuments won't change history, despite the fact that many of those monuments were erected to do just that, to change history, to make it feel as though the South had won. Or in a worst case scenario, they were erected during the civil rights era in order to incite and inspire fear and terror in African American communities seek seeking civil justice and civil rights for themselves. The monuments themselves were erected to change history, and now we sit around and argue that taking them down won't change history. And it's spewed when we try to abdicate our responsibility for the ongoing racial problems in our country by talking about many sides or both sides as if they're all remotely the same. By saying that that was a long time ago and I didn't have anything to do with it. By ignoring the privilege and power we have at the expense of people of color simply because we are white. It is shameful and it is counter to the teaching and example of Christ's life. Listen and understand. Listen and understand. It is not what goes into a person's mouth that defiles. It is what comes out of a person's mouth that defiles. Before we sing our closing hymn this morning, a hymn about the new creation of God, a hymn about what happens when we accept God's forgiveness, when we accept God's grace. Before we dare sing that hymn, I want you to pray with me, and I'm going to be praying a prayer of confession. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, the watchers of Zion have called peace, peace, when there was no peace. Wherefore have you so long withheld from us the influence of your Holy Spirit? Why have you hardened our hearts? It is because we have honored you with our lips when our hearts were far from you. 
Return again to us, O Lord, and pardon this iniquity of your servants. Cause your face to shine upon us, and we shall be saved. O visit us with your salvation. Raise up sons and daughters from Abraham and Sarah, and grant that there might come a mighty shaking of dry bones among us, and a great ingathering of souls. Be pleased to grant that the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ may be built up, that all nations and kindreds and tongues and peoples might be brought to the knowledge of the truth, and we at last meet around your throne and join in celebrating your praises. Amen. Our hymn of sending forth today is This is a Day of New Beginnings. It's number 383 in our hymnals. Let's stand and sing together. Yeah. 